Good morning, you guys. It's your boy Bill Mahari here. Represent Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to the entire LDBC and the entire basketball community. If you want more basketball content, tune in to Basketball Conversations every Friday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. is where we discuss basketball-related topics, news, debates, and everything else in the world of basketball. We're about a couple of weeks away from the start of the rebooted NBA season. So, you know, tune in for all the latest news and latest updates that has been going on as we as as we get nearer back to basketball, too. If you're new to the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get all the latest notifications when I start dropping videos and live streams. So this is another episode of Morning Historical Perspective. This is basically my weekly episode Uh Every Monday through Friday at 8 a.m. Central Time is where I basically, you know, analyze, you know, players, uh, series, great teams, anything else you want me to discuss about. All you have to do is just post something in the in the comment section, and I'll do a video for you ASAP, Rocky. So this one's a uh, subscriber request, and this one we're going to talk about a player that is not really much talked about in NBA circles. But his uh, impact and the way that he was remembered outside of basketball has cannot be understated enough. And his name was Bobby Fills. Now, I did remember some about Bobby Fills back when I was a youngster. I was about seven years old around that time. But he was pretty much a guy that pretty much worked his way to the NBA. And he was the kind of player that was basically, you know, worked his way up the ladder to get where he, to get where he wanted to be. And so, basically, growing up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, you know, he pretty much discovered basketball as a young, as a very young kid, right around, you know, right around five to six years old. And in the process, he never really, he never really thought about basketball as a serious thing for him. Because actually, what I learned was when I was watching some of the videos and reading some of his stories, he actually wanted to be more of a doctor. His wife, his wife, you know, pretty much said that he wanted to be a doctor than a basketball athlete, but he grew into his frame. He worked hard, you know, to become the best player that he could be, and he achieved his dream of playing in the M playing in the NBA. But coming from Southern University in Baton Rouge, you know, I mean, he led the NBA in three point field goals per game with about four four and a half uh, three point field goals made per uh, per game, and. He averaged at least 17 points per game, you know, during his time at Southern University. And unfortunately, it's a college that doesn't get a lot of, you know, spotlight or less than get a lot of attention. But he made the, made the most out of it. In fact, he wasn't really the most highly recruited player at, at his position at the time. But he really made the use out of it. And, you know, when his career pretty much ended, you know, during the or late 80s to the early 90s, you know, he finished his career averaging 17 points per game. And... He, in his senior year, he averaged 28.4 points per game and shot 34% from the three-point line, okay? He shot 40% from the field and also 72% from the foul line. So he was pretty much an efficient, you know, all-around shooting guard score, you know, during his uh, basketball career in college. And then when he got into the NBA, um, he was drafted, you know, within the second round by the Milwaukee Bucks. But unfortunately, he was cut without even playing a game. And he had to literally play games out of the Sulex Falls Sky Force out of the CBA at the time. And then before he basically got basically joined the Cleveland Cavaliers. Then he basically played in the CBA a few more times before ultimately playing with the Cleveland Cavaliers this time pretty much for good. And he played at least he pretty much played, you know, for his basketball for his basically his time in Cleveland. He played six seasons in Cleveland and he was very much. He pretty much improved his his uh his frame. Coming in at six six five and two hundred pounds, you know he was pretty much a scorer when he came in from college. But then he improved his game significantly and turned himself into an, a tenacious defender, a hardworking defender that would basically push you, and you know, and basically would toughen you up. And when a lot of it, when I've read some, when I watched some of the videos about some of his former teammates, what they would talk about him, he was basically a hardworking person that. You know, would push. You know, the starters. He would push the star, the star players. He would push the entire team to play at their absolute best. And he was pretty much a tenacious defender who resembled the the body frame of an NFL linebacker than he was a basketball player. And even in '96, Michael Jordan even remarked how Bobby Fields was perhaps his toughest defender that he ever faced against. And that's pretty much high praise coming from a guy that has faced against a lot of tougher defenders throughout his entire basketball career. But 
you know, Michael pretty much admitted that he was the toughest guy that he ever faced because of his large frame and because of his ability, ability to use his frame to push guys off, off of their position and would make life difficult on the, on the offensive side of the ball. So pretty much, so pretty much after his uh, six seasons in the, Cle the Cleveland Cavaliers, he signed as a free agent to the uh, Charlotte Hornets. And this is very important because his scoring averages pretty much improved. He averaged 10 and a half points per game in Cleveland, but he averaged 12.3 points per game in his three seasons in Charlotte. And he was pretty much a mentor and he was pretty much a leader, you know, around a young team at that time. And anyone that anyone that talked about Bobby Fields and NBA struggles would pretty much tell you that he was a guy that was well respected around the community. Everybody loved him. Everybody would appreciate his work ethic and his contributions to the community cannot be understated enough. He was he will always involve, you know, in charitable organizations. He always was hanging out with the youth, trying to inspire them to achieve their dreams of playing professional basketball. And his kids, you know, were his inspiration because he always played hard for his kids every time he stepped on the floor. Sadly, though, you know, his life came to a tragic end. And during the 99-2000 season on January 12th of 2000, um, he was pretty much killed in a car accident. Uh, he was traveling behind his teammate Wesley, Wesley uh, David Wesley, and they were they were basically driving over 100 miles an hour, arriving in his 1997 Porsche, and he and it's basically spun out of control and crossed into um, incoming traffic and basically hit another car, and when the which turns the car was struck by the rear by the rear of a minivan. Ultimately, the two other passengers that were hit by Phil's car survived. Unfortunately for Phil's. That wasn't to be the case. He basically died at the scene. And it was a very much a tragic thing for the Charlotte Hornets organization because he was the he was the rock. He was the leader. He was the guy that everybody, you know, gravitated around, you know, for, for, for perseverance through tough times. And, you know, it was pretty much a hard experience for a lot of the players. I remember I remember what uh, uh, Baron Davis, who was a rookie at the time, you know, talked about how he basically saw uh, Bobby basically before the before the accident happened and he talked and basically he basically talked about how he basically said you know giving him as much love and all that stuff and then hours later when he saw david wesley he saw him you know with his hands in the air you know pretty much devastated about what happened and you know it was a very traumatic thing and the day before and the day after the accident they were scheduled to play a game i think it was against the new york knicks and the game was almost delayed and then afterwards the both teams, the Knicks and the uh, Hornets, attended the uh, the funeral of Bobby Phils. And his wife talked about how, you know, honored she was because they recognized, because she recognized how loved and how respected he was in NBA circles. And, you know, months later, you know, weeks later, you know, weeks later after his, uh, actually say a month later after his, his death, you know, on, on February the 9th, uh, before against the Cleveland Cavaliers, uh, the organization announced that they, they, they retired his number 13 jersey and raised it up to the Raptors at the Charlotte Coliseum. And it was a really an honor, it was really a uh, revealing thing because they because the, the franchise started back in 19 in 1988-89. Actually no, no. It was I think it was 88-89 I think. Yeah, I think so, yeah. And they were just kicking off their first decade in the NBA. And they never had a number retired, but it was pretty much a heartwarming thing because it was the fans' way of saying goodbye to a great guy that meant a lot, and it's only three seasons in Charlotte, North Carolina, and you could, it pretty much explained a lot how much he was influenced. And he was basically, basically, his two children, you know, his uh, his son Trey, you know, played at Charlotte Christian High School and uh, and then played college basketball at Yale University. You know, what I'm saying. And then his daughter, you know, pretty much, you know, graduated with a basically graduated, graduated from grad school too as well. And so, and also, and also the other thing too is that her daughter, her his daughter also played, you know, basketball and played for Florida Gulf Coast University. So his children, you know, pretty much followed his uh, father's, you know, passion for basketball. And, you know, his, this after the Charlotte Hornets moved to New Orleans, you know, the number was basically reissued again. You know, even when during the Bobcat days, but after Michael Jordan, you know, bought the franchise and renamed it as the Charlotte uh, Hornets once again, they pretty much re-retired that number to pay tribute to him. 
you know, when they basically returned back to as the uh, Charlotte Hornets. Um, February, uh, basically on November the 1st of 2014, you know, when they renamed themselves as the Charlotte Hornets, you know, they basically rehung his number 13 jersey up to the Raptors in the Spectrum Center, which is really classy on Michael's part because Michael respected Bobby Fields a lot as just, as not just as a competitor, but as a man too. And that was really a touching thing for not just for the organization, but for Michael to do something like that. So, you know, I remember I, the one thing I would personally say about what I remember about Bobby Fields is that I, when I played, you know, the first version of NBA 2K on the Sega Dreamcast, you know, Bobby Fields to me, you know, was a guy that, you know, was a very versatile two guard. And I used him a lot. And shooting threes. And I remember one game when I played against my brother, he would he knocked down 10 threes in a row and was like, and I was like, whoa, that's crazy. It was knocking down threes left and right. And my brother was getting frustrated. It's like, why is he making every single three out there? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that was just that was pretty much a fun time. That first two gay game with Allen Iverson on the second Dreamcast, that was the beginning, man. That was the beginning of the revolution that you see in all 2K games right now. You know what I'm saying? So but that's just my two cents about, you know, about Bobby Fields, you know. And, and you know, the weird thing, too, is, is that, that sa- a couple of months later, uh, I think it was in March or maybe March or April, I think, um, Malik Seeley, who played for the Minnesota Timberwolves at that time, too. Actually, it was in May, my mistake, in May. Um, he was also killed in a car crash, too, as well, basically from a drunk driver, too, as well, after he attended KG's, you know, birthday party. <laughs> It was just it was just a pretty much a sad couple of months there for the NBA too as well. So and they too also retired his number two jersey. And you know what? I might do a video about that in the future though. Let me know if you guys are interested in seeing that. But yeah, you know, Bobby Fields was a guy that was well respected and he was loved by the by a lot of people in the NBA. And when you hear a lot of the people talk about his life and talked about how much he was loved by the reporters and by the people who worked in the organization, he was an honorable man that really did a lot for the city of Charlotte and only his three years, you know, in playing with the Hornets. So that's just pretty much what it is, so guys. But but tell me what you guys think in the comments section.